Hey everyone, my name is Sean and welcome to Church Online. In just a few moments, we'll be moving to a time of worship and then we'll hear a live sermon from one of our teaching pastors. Wherever in the world you're joining us from, we believe God has something for you in this service. And if you're in San Diego, join us at one of our in-person services. Now let's go to church together. Everyone go ahead and take a seat. Say hi to a neighbor. Good morning. My name's DJ. It's so good to be with you all. 
All I want is for Josh Barnard to play that groove every morning as I wake up. Just kind of like, it would get me moving. Hey, I really quickly want to speak to the men in this room. We got a thing called Mindset going on. Mindset's our men's retreat we have every single year. And it's on April 26th and 27th. I want to let you know about it because it is going to be an incredible opportunity uh, to gather together and to grow and to learn about what God has called us as men and as leaders and as fathers and as friends to step into situations and how to shift our mindset to become more like Jesus. And men, if that's not inspiring to you, I want to talk to the wives in the room. You know where you are. My wife's somewhere. She's telling me you got to go. But hey, what I want to say is we would love to see you there. It's going to be on, again, April 26th and 27th. It's about $320. And then if you sign up before the 25th of March, so we'll see you there. You can scan the QR code. Talk to a staff member. We got men in the lobby handing out uh, different flyers for that. We'd love to see you there. Uh, We have Easter coming up on March uh, 30th and 31st. We got two days of services. It's going to be Saturday at 5 p.m. And then Sunday morning, we're adding a 12 p.m. Our one little ask, we just want to say is, hey, if you go to the 9 and 1030, which are the only options, so you all go to one of them, uh, if you have the opportunity, and it's not too inconvenient, we'd love to invite you to either the noon or the 5 p.m. on Saturday. That helps create some space because there's a lot of new friends, a lot of new families who will be coming in for the first time, and that's the most optimal service we have, so we want to just create room. So if you can, we'd love to invite you to do that. If not, it doesn't matter because we're going to celebrate the resurrection with you at any of those services. Services. Sound good, everybody? What would you stand with me? We are going to continue in worship, but before we do, let's posture our hearts by looking to the Word of God and opening the book of Psalms and reading what God's Word encourages us, uh, encourages us with this morning. It says, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Church, would you hold out your hands with me this morning? Let's just take a breath together. He continues in the Psalms. It says, The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Church, we just hold our hands open. God, right now we are uh, just so thankful for the safety that's found in your presence. And so we bring whatever it is we may have carried into this space. And we hold them open hands and we say, God, we trust you. We just ask for your blessing, for your favor, for your protection and your grace right now. We sing this out.
This morning, we plan to take communion together as a church body following the message. Please take a moment to grab whatever form of bread and juice you have to represent the elements. And we'll be back after the sermon to take the elements together. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song.
feel like a really good Christian right now? You're here. You're in the building. Good morning, Church Online. Hope you're well. Uh, you, no, you're too sleepy to get that joke? Okay. Uh, if you were really good Christians, you would have been here at the early service, by the way, just so you know. Um, I'm just kidding. They, they just feel more guilty than you do, okay? Uh, thrilled that you're here. Is my mic on? Oh, okay. Good. All right, good. Uh, <laughs> apparently I'm the one who needed to get more sleep. Uh, I uh, am so thrilled to be in this series that we're in. Uh, we're looking at the last moments, last breaths of Jesus's life and the last words that he spoke from the cross. And if you're just jumping into this series, the heart of it is we don't want to just glance at the cross. We don't want to just drive by the cross. We tend to, you know, put it in the corner and we you talk about the manger. We like the manger. We like Easter. And the cross is obviously the logo of our faith. It's a symbol of our faith. But how do we bring it to the front and center for these days leading up to Easter? And that's the heart of this. And something can be so familiar to us that over time it becomes unfamiliar. We were talking about that last week. Uh, we had the, the chocolate-covered cross that in time <laughs> Uh, we just, it's just a, a part of life. We don't really get what we were just singing, that nothing but the blood, that's what we cry out together. It's the blood of Jesus and salvation and life comes from the blood alone. And how do we build our faith around that? How do we come to this? And I, I think it's some, one of the, the, the problems with the cross is that it's just kind of swept up in our traditions, and all of us, you, you have been framed in your life by traditions. We all have traditions. Uh, how many of you in your family would say, we have some weird traditions. I don't even want to invite people over. They're weird. You know, you just do weird stuff. Uh, and every culture has weird traditions. I was talking to somebody recently from Denmark, and they said, yeah, uh, every uh, single person, when they turn 25, if they're still single, they get paraded in the street, and everybody throws cinnamon at them. I was like, that's that's weird. That's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Uh, anybody from Denmark? I, don't know. Uh, uh, I was in Italy a few years ago, and they said, oh, you uh, just missed. We had the Battle of Oranges. I was like, what are you talking about, the Battle of Oranges? They're like, well, we, for three days, throw oranges at each other in the street. No one knows why. You're like, why? Uh, we, as a family, we do the Battle of Chicken Nuggets a lot. It's a very different tradition in our house. Uh, <laughs> But we have traditions, and you have traditions at Easter, you have traditions at Christmas, and the cross is a part of it. We hang it around our neck in gold, we have it on the hill over the 15, we see it, we know it, but it can lose the, the power and just be a part of the tradition. I think at the same time, so many of our traditions, we go, why do we do that? Nobody really knows, and the cross can be like that. If, for most Christians, if you said, hey, why the cross? Why did Jesus have to die? I don't know. Why did Jesus, how did this come to be that Jesus was sacrificed for our sins and somehow that was the way the story had to go down? And today in this story, I thirst is the statement of Jesus that we're going to look at, which is very, very odd. Why did Jesus say, I thirst? Of all the things that are happening to his body, uh, nails driven through his feet, nails through his wrists. Why would this be the pain point that he acknowledges? He doesn't acknowledge any other pain. He never, we said this last week, he doesn't cry out, my foot, my foot. Uh, it's the only time he mentions any of the physicality of it is, is I thirst, and why is that? And so we're going to look at the cross. We're going to go to the cross again today. Now, the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, uh, they had their own traditions, and we'll see this, which is really one of the reasons that points to the statement, I thirst, and the cross itself, but a long part of the history of the people of God, and you've probably heard of this before, uh, was they had a meal called the Passover. Let me hear you say Passover. 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 Now, this goes back a thousand years, and it goes back to the fact that your ancestors were in slavery and bondage in Egypt, and God met them there, and through a series of 10 plagues, had delivered your ancestors out of bondage and out of slavery. And the 10th plague was the worst plague, and it was the plague where the Israelites had to put blood over their door, a blood of a lamb, hint, hint, as a way to allow their firstborn child to live. And when the 10th plague hit the Pharaoh and his firstborn son died, that was when he relented and said, I've had enough. And Moses and the Israelites 
the Red Sea parts and they begin their journey into the desert. And so every year God said on the calendar, I want you to remember what I did for you. I want you to remember that you are not in slavery anymore because God with a mighty hand raised you up. And so he meets Moses very early in the journey in the wilderness and he says, hey, every year we're gonna have something called Passover and it's gonna be a meal. And Moses says, okay, how's it gonna work? And he says, here's the deal. And he says this, this is the mandate, Exodus chapter 12 and uh, a lot of scripture this morning. I'm sure you're having your quiet time in Exodus this morning, but just to make the people around you feel more comfortable, if you have a Bible, you can turn there. Uh, it says this, Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and he said to them, go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the what? The And the Passover lamb was a centerpiece of the Passover meal. And it was a way to remember that your ancestors had slaughtered a lamb and they had taken the blood and they placed it over their doorframe. And so this is the next part. It says that the, uh, take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the doorframe. This is what your ancestors did in slavery. Now, that sounds odd uh, at a certain level, but think about it through our language and through our lens. They literally, when they told their story, they would say, what was your defense when you were in slavery? What was your, what was your way out of bondage? They would say, oh, uh, nothing but the blood. Uh, there was power in the blood. As moms and dads, some of you today, you got in the car and you drove your uh, kids to church. It was a way in your family where you were doing the same thing. You were placing blood over the door frame of your house and you were saying, the enemy has no claim on my house. Uh, the, the angel of death isn't getting in, in, in these doors. At night, some of you moms, you dads, you take your kids by hand, you pray over them. It's the same thing. You're, you're saying, hey, uh, in the same way you have been covered in the blood, you're praying, hey, I, I pray my, my, my house, I pray my kids receive the power of the blood. And so a thousand years before Jesus, they, they knew there, there was power in the blood. The blood is what had delivered you and saved you. Hint, hint uh, of where we're going today. So they have this ongoing meal. Okay, why are we doing this? It was a tradition. It would go on and on and on. In verse 26, God says, and when your children ask you, your kids ever ask you, why do we do this? Why, we're gonna take the elements of communion today. Uh, why the bread? Why the, the cup? Why, why do we do this? Why the cross? What, is all this, what does all this mean? He says, and when your children ask, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. And so the only reason we're here is the blood. How we survived was the blood. Our, our one defense was the blood. When the angel of death came, we pled the blood. That was all we had, and God with a mighty hand delivered us. Uh, are you with me? Uh, th 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 there's power in the blood. And so this was the ritual. This was the, the scene. Now, uh, when John writes his version of events of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John is going to tell you again and again that when Christ comes, he uh, has a name for Jesus, and it's not pulled out of thin air. He calls Jesus the Lamb. Might that mean something? Uh, he says this, John chapter 1, starting in verse 29, it says, The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Verse 36, look, the Lamb of God. Now, you don't have to turn with, with me in all these because I'm going to read a lot. Uh, now, John's going to also tell you something quite interesting. Every year at Passover, you would have about two million pilgrims come from all edges of the Gentile world who pledged their allegiance to Yahweh, and they would come for the week of Passover to Israel. This would happen. It was an eight-day festival. Pilgrims from all over the world, two million of them, would descend on the city streets of Jerusalem. 
Uh, Jesus, why is he in Jerusalem at the time of his death, these last seven days of his life? Why is he in Jerusalem? He's there because it's Passover, and that's what you did. He's just a part of the pilgrimage. And so what would happen every year uh, on the Thursday, this was mandated all the way back in Exodus, is that you would slaughter the lamb, and this would happen at a very specific time. And so quite literally, uh, in Jerusalem, in the temple, uh, most historians would tell you about 250,000 lambs were being slaughtered to feed the two million people that were there. Uh, the Kidron Valley, which runs right beneath the temple, uh, it was said the rivers would just flow with blood that was being poured out from the sacrifices and from these lambs. Now, what does John tell you? It's Passover week. Jesus is going to the cross. He notices a very specific detail, verse 14 of John 19. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. So as Jesus, the Lamb of God, is going to the cross, what's happening across the Kidron Valley? <laughs> 250,000 lambs are being slaughtered. And here John is saying the Lamb of God, the final payment for sin, is going to the cross. And so the Passover meal, the Passover elements, it was all the way John was going to frame the story. And so as we're going to take these elements in a few moments together, John is going to give you a whole new way to understand the power of the blood, the power of the sacrifice that was made at the cross by Jesus Christ. It says this in Mark. So you probably remember, you saw the artwork from Da Vinci, The Last Supper. Uh, Jesus on the Thursday, with his disciples, before the Friday that he's crucified, he gathers and he has what? Passover, because it's what you do. Uh, his aunts and uncles did it, their aunts and uncles did it all for a thousand years. Uh, they had done this. And so he's in Jerusalem with his disciples, and he says, hey, time for the Passover meal. Uh, everybody else in Jerusalem was doing the same thing. So this wasn't like... Uh, you know, the last meal, and they just decided, you know, Jesus is like, hey, let's have a meal together before I die. No, this was just ritual. This is what you did. Mark 14, verse 12, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, which was a part of the Passover meal, when it was customary to sacrifice the what? The Passover lamb. Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go? Uh, none of them, they probably had just rolled out of Lazarus's house up the road. They're now entering into Jerusalem. They have nowhere to stay. So where are we going to actually eat this meal? We got to eat the meal. We've done this every year. Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sends two of his disciples. I love this. Jesus always has the disciples on the buddy system. I don't know why, uh, but there's always two of them telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house, he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room? Where may I eat the, the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. And so there's all these elements of the Passover meal. The disciples left, went into the city, found the things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover meal. Now at a Passover meal, some of you have done this before, there are six elements on the table. It would take several hours to do this, and all of these are to remember something significant in your past, that God had delivered you from slavery. One of the elements on the table uh, was salt water that you would go around the table and you would drink from the cup, and it was a way to remember the tears that your ancestors cried in slavery and in bondage. There were bitter herbs on the table, and everyone would go around the table. They would eat the bitter herbs. It was a way to remember the harshness and bitterness of life and slavery. Uh, the, the Jewish mind, the Hebrew mind, the scriptures, uh, far more image-driven, far more picture-oriented. Uh, we're uh, not that way. Uh, we're bullet point people. Just give me the information. Just tell me the... How many of you hate long emails? <laughs> of course. Like, can we just put this in a pop-up book, for crying out loud? Uh, that's the Jewish mind, pictures, images. So all these are to recall something, make you feel something connected to your bloodline. Uh, there's also, and this is the most significant detail, there's four cups of wine on the table. 
some of you are like, I think I had a Passover meal last night, actually. This was, uh, now you're preaching. Uh, so the, this was for a reason. Uh, the four cups were to signify the four promises God had made to your ancestors while you were in slavery. This is in Exodus 6. After they were delivered, there were four promises made. So each of the cup has a significance. And you would take the cup, you would drink the cup, you would go around the table, and everyone would remember the promises that were made. So this is the scene. Now, at the table, uh, how many of the disciples are there? Twelve, all, all twelve, which is not an insignificant detail, uh, because two of them, uh, one will be redeemed later, but Judas is at the table. We can't forget that detail. It says, when evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve, all twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. This is a very awkward family dinner. How many of you have been to some of those meals where Aunt Lorraine started running her mouth? And, oh, there she goes. So this is one of those meals. You're like, uh, really? Passover? You're going to call out somebody betray? What is he talking about? Uh, well, Judas, of course, I mean, this is the scene. He says, hey, uh, they were saddened. One of them, uh, one by one, they go around the table. So they are at the table, all the elements on the table. Surely you don't mean me. Surely you don't mean me. Uh, and... How many of you have ever come to the table before? You've come to the elements, and you thought to yourself, I am not worthy of taking these elements. That's the point of communion. It is a holy practice for very unholy people. And if you come to the table today, and you feel like, uh, I'm not good enough, uh, I know what I've done, you have to remember Judas was there. And no matter what you've done in your story, uh, the power of these elements is that you need to know Christianity is not just information in your ears. Ultimately, it has to be a cup to your lips where you understand the forgiveness of God that is washed over you. Uh, Judas was there. And so when you come to the table, you remember uh, the, the worst things I've done, the worst moments of my life, somehow there's power in the blood. And so at this meal, here he is with the disciples. It takes a weird turn, and then it takes another weird turn. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. Now, at this point, you do this every year. Everything's operating according to script. This is how the Passover meal works. You take the bread, you break it. It was one of the elements on the table. But all of a sudden, Jesus is going to change the script, and he says, I want you to take it. This is my body. Excuse me, boss. What verse in Exodus is that? We don't have that one in there. So he's going a different direction, and the meal is going to take a strange turn. So the communion table that we come to is Christ's way of transforming the elements that had already and always been there. He then took the cup. Now, why is the cup on the table? There's four cups on the table. This is all part of the meal. So he takes a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. Okay, this is all part of the promises we're remembering. And he says something again. He's off script. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many, he said. So there's a new, the old meal was about the old covenant God had made, but this is about a new covenant. God and sinners reconciled. All people uh, can be reconciled to this God. It's not about what family you were born into. It's not about uh, how high you've strived and climbed and how good you've been. It is the uh, upside down. It is the grace of God is going to flow to you. This is the new covenant. Take this cup, and the disciples have to be feeling a little strange at this point. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine. Well, what's the fruit of the vine? That's wine. So he's doing something really odd here. 
he's essentially, uh, what most scholars will tell you, he's drinking three of the cups, but he's not finishing the meal. He said, I'm not going to drink any more wine. There's one more cup. And what you traditionally would do at the Passover meal, you would drink the four cups, and when it was done, you would sing a hymn. It was Psalm 114 through Psalm 118. It says here, Jesus says, I'm not going to drink any more wine. I will later, he says, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Well, when is that? In verse 26, it says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so this is a very out of order, very chaotic, traditional Passover meal. And it's incomplete. He says, I'm not going to drink from the fruit of the vine. So he leaves the cup on the table, which all the disciples would be going, we got we're not done, boss. We got, we got more to do. But he sings the hymn early, and he goes to the Mount of Olives. Uh, this would be the equivalent of you have Christmas morning, you, you know, play the music, but you don't open presents. Like, no, we got we to gotta open the presents. That's like the, that's like the point. That's why we're here. And this is a strange scene. Uh, if you read any of the accounts, the main feature of the meal is the lamb. That's all the sacrifices we made to, to, to the lamb. Uh, but there's no lamb on the table. Why? Because the lamb that is going to be sacrificed is where? He's at the table. And so when is the lamb going to finish the meal? When is the fourth cup coming? Now he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying. He says, God, will you take this what from me? This cup. What, what's coming down? What he knows, something is coming down. He knows the cross, the sacrifice is coming down. So he goes to the cross, and John has walked you through. The Lamb of God has come into the world. And here in this moment, on the same day when the lambs are being slaughtered in the temple courts, here's the Lamb of God hanging on the cross, and John's framing the story that way. John 19, verse 28, it says, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished... And so that scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said what? The fourth statement, I am thirsty. Now, he hasn't noticed or at least acknowledged any other pain at this point. If your feet are broken, your back's been whipped, your bloody crown of thorns on your head, is thirst going to be the first thing you notice? (laughs) What is he doing here? You read the next verse, and he says, a jar of wine was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the what? Hyssop. Where did that come from? All the way back in Exodus 12, this is what your relatives did when they put the blood of the lamb on their door. When he received the drink, he lifted, says, lifted it to Jesus' lips when he had received the drink. So when does he drink the fourth cup of wine? At the cross. He now says, what? It is finished. What's finished? Well, at a certain level, it's the payment for sin. It's the payment for your sin. It's so that a new blood can be your defense the payment in full for your sin. You don't owe anything. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is one mediator between God and man, and it is Jesus Christ. And it's in this moment, it is finished. But if the story ends there, it certainly isn't finished. Uh, Easter will come. At another level, what else is finished? The meal. (laughs) The final payment and sacrifice for sin. And in this moment, as he's breathing his last breath, he's saying, no more lambs are going to have to be sacrificed. I am the final lamb that has been paid in full for the sins of the world. And John tells you another interesting detail. If you uh, go back to Exodus uh, in Exodus 12, as they're talking about the preparations for the meal uh, that you would eat, come in to celebrate Passover, it would say the, the, the lamb must be eaten inside the house. Take none of the meat outside the house. Do not break any of the bones. That was the command. 
given to the Israelites. John, when he's telling you about the cross, a couple of verses down after Jesus had breathed his last breath, it says, verse 32, the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified, so criminal on the left, and then those of the others. So they broke the criminal on the left and the criminal on the right's legs. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, what does it say? They did not break his legs. What is John telling you? <laughs> this is the payment. This is the sacrificial lamb once and for all. Uh, the lamb's legs weren't broken because it had to be pure. This pure and spotless lamb has breathed his last so that you and I can breathe in the life-giving work of salvation and we can breathe in new life as a new creation in Christ Jesus. And that's the power of the lamb. The lamb was slain so that you, when you stand before God and God says, what have you done to enter the gates of heaven? In that moment, what is your case? What is your righteousness? In that moment, for all of us, you will plead the blood. You will stand in that moment and say, I have no case except the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, the blood it flew from his side has flown to you and covered you and covered me. And that's the payment for your sin. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how badly you've blown it in life. You plead the blood and there is no defense. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how much money's in your bank account. I don't care how successful you've been. You plead the blood. The blood is the one payment for your sin. And in the same way our ancestors would cover their door in blood and say, this is our defense. This is how we cover our lives. We cover ourselves in the blood of Jesus and we say, this is my defense. This because of the payment of the lamb is how I know I have received life and there is no other defense and there is no other plea than the blood and that's the power of the cross that's the power john's telling you of the sacrifice that was made so now the story that is our anchor story is not what god did to get israel land our anchor story is that our god has delivered us from the bondage and the slavery of sin so that we can have life with him not on a piece of territory but in the kingdom of god eternally forever and that's your story and that's my story and i'm sticking to it <laughs> that's the power of the blood you need the blood you have to have the blood. And so when you come to the table today, there's only three things in the scriptures that are talked about as the body of Christ. The first is the physical body of Christ. The second is uh, the church. When we gather together, when we go into the city, we go as the body of Christ, which means you are a part of what Paul described over and over again, uh, the physical work that Christ did on this earth where he healed and he, he prayed and he delivered. When we go into the city, when people come here and they're in bondage to sin and death, we are the body of Christ in the same way where they can be healed and delivered. That's our work as the church. That's the power of the church. But the communion elements are also the body of Christ, which means when you take these, it's not just, well, we just do this. It means you are recognizing in that moment, you're saying, I plead the blood. The sacrifice of the lamb, this is my only defense. I have no other defense. In the same way, moms and dads used to cover the door as a way to say, that's our defense. I now come to the cup and I say, this is my defense. It washes over your past. It transforms your past. If you come today and, and, and you remember uh, the worst things you've done, you have all your regrets, all your shame, all the moments, all the, the fig leaves you've put on to cover something that you are ashamed of in life. At the cup, you come and you say, I plead the blood. My past has been transformed because if Judas was allowed to be at the table, then so am I. And I'm coming to the table today. The grace and the mercy of God has found me. I plead the blood. It transforms your present. How many of us in this moment, maybe it's a son, maybe it's a daughter, maybe it's a uh, self-inflicted wounds in your life where you're going, I don't know what to do. I have made a mess of things. There is a mess of things. I don't know what to do. 
You plead the blood, would in the same way, God, my ancestors covered their house in the forgiveness of God. And they said, hey, uh, the blood is our defense. Some of us today as moms and dads with a broken heart over a son and daughter, you're coming to the table saying, I need God in my now. And this is a way for me to cover my door frame in the blood of Jesus and pray that it flows into a broken and busted relationship with a son or a daughter. It's a way to say over your 13-year-old today, I'm covering my house as a go-first mom, as a go-first dad. I'm going first to cover them in the blood. And ultimately, they have to make that choice. But I know that in my house, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. And I am posting it as far as the world can see. We are covered in the blood. I plead the blood. It's a way to remind you of your future. Every single one of us in this room doesn't matter your physical pain, doesn't matter your spiritual pain, doesn't matter your emotional pain. The scriptures say in Revelation, one day the Lamb of God will wipe every tear from your eye once and for all. And it's describing heaven in that moment as a meal that is called the supper of the Lamb. And the table of God is big enough to extend in your direction. I don't care who you are today. And so when you come to the table, you are reminded that in the end, when all things have been reconciled to God, when every knee has bowed, every tongue has confessed, you are there in that moment in the full wholeness and the mercy of God. That's your future. And if that's your future, I don't care what your present or your past is. And how do you have that? You plead the blood. You plead the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can save my sin. Nothing but the blood. Oh, how precious is the flow that covers you and makes you white as snow today. Would you come to the table? And when you put the cup to your lips, would this not just be information in your ears, but it would be something you receive to wash over your sins because Christ and Christ alone can do that and is your defense. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for the blood. Nothing but the blood is my righteousness. Nothing but the blood can save me. Oh, how precious is the flow. We come to the fount today, God. And we know there's life here. There's life in this room. As the church, there's life in this room. As we sit in rows, it's really just one big table today, God. And so we're coming to partake a little foretaste of the meal to come when all things are reconciled, every tear wiped from our eye. And we ask in this moment, God, would you crash heaven into earth as we're here just pleading the blood. We plead it over our past. We plead it over our kids. It's our one defense. It's our righteousness. And we thank you, God. Our bill's been paid in full. And with the bread, with the cup, be our reminder today of where life and salvation comes from. We plead the blood, and we have no other plea. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. grace and peace come to the table.
2,000 years ago, Jesus sat down with his disciples in what is known as the Upper Room. They were there to celebrate Passover, an event that took place over 1,200 years before Jesus came from heaven to earth. It was a time when the children of Israel were in bondage to Egypt, and God sent Moses to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. It took 10 plagues. The 10th plague was the angel of death, in which the firstborn of every family was killed. That is, except for the firstborn of the families of the children of Israel. You see, they were instructed to take the blood of a lamb and place it on the doorposts of their homes, and the angel would pass over that home. 
than 1,200 years later. Jesus is sitting down with his disciples and he's about to reveal something that they cannot begin to comprehend and yet we now understand 2,000 years later that Jesus is the Passover lamb, come to take away the sins of the world. So he just sat down in that upper room with his disciples. He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it. And he said to them, just as he says to us, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. And then after dinner, he took the cup of wine and he said to his disciples, just as he says to us, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, a covenant confirmed by the shedding of my blood for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty for our sins so that we could have a relationship with you, a perfect and holy God. Help us, Father, to live out our life in such a way that we bring glory and honor to your name. We ask for that in the powerful and matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We believe following Jesus was meant to be done in community. If you need to connect with the pastor to receive prayer or have any questions about our church, please call us at the number below. And if you feel like God is calling you to step up and become more passionate about how you live out your faith, visit gofirst.church to get to know our values and connect with one of our staff to get involved. We'll see you next time.